So um, just a, a, a short recap, uh, Michael, I, I'm not sure you, you got the, the session before here, but we discussed a little bit the um, role of banks and the transparency. Banks already on, on a public CBCR format need to publish on their websites and, and how uh, the, in the second instance, the uh, extractive industry has, has followed suit, uh, also being heavy, heavy regulated on uh, being uh, sharing public uh, publicly information on their tax position far beyond just the, the tax paragraph in your 10K and your uh, annual reports and how how much does transparency pay off if, if it uh, goes all the way. Uh, Kuntal indicated uh, rightfully so that there's a real benefit in India to be very transparent um, while Luis um, uh, for for probably same set of arguments that said there's too much transparency these days if you don't know what the other side is doing with it. Uh, and, and what I think we would like to address during this session is, is if, if you're tax compliant and you're fully transparent on it, does that mean you never get a disruption of, of your business license? And, and uh, I guess in the illustrations of banks and mining industries that's quite clear because there's a license to operate and it's locked into a capital requirement directive in the case of the banks that's the lock-in for your public cbcr so uh but the, the question of obviously is is this a general statement we can expand beyond to just the banks and the, and the extractive industry so let's go to the first So as I, I said, uh, the, the banks and transparency and compliance requirements is a stepping stone for governments to maybe go for similar transparency in the public domain of others. Um, the, the crisis uh, will, will uh, put governments in a, in a spot where more money is needed and, and therefore the the, the constant drive for a higher level of transparency and compliance for, from corporates seems to be an, a never ending story. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think what we saw on day, day two, actually day one, uh, if governments don't get it, they start taking very unreasonable positions. So, so day one, we, we already addressed uh, those uh, extreme positions taken by governments. If we run back on the next slide uh, what what we looked at um if we go to could go to the next slide so th this is a slide from day one when we talked about taxpayer rights we said the, the start is on the left top corner and the finish in, on the right um uh, the, the right bottom um it's almost like a, a game of monopoly uh, you you think you start with a whole po pocket of money uh, but when you you reach the finish, maybe uh, uh, you have no money left and and no uh, real estate on top of that. Uh, then your 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 game is is uh, is very challenging. So so here we say, okay, this is a whole series of rights taxpayers have. But if we look at full transparency and we we look at CBCR and and we look at the right to privacy, which is on on this slide. Uh, then my question would be how to deal with fishing expeditions like this CBCR, um, this public uh, CBCR. On top of that, if you're a bank, your public CBCR reporting on top of that, it, it becomes a cascading of fishing expedition where it is not per se clear what information tax authorities are going to use for what purpose. Um, then uh, also the right to confidentiality. If you look at the, the public publicly published CBCR of Barclays, uh, we, we looked at uh, the previous session. What, what is your right to confidentiality? So how much detail uh, you can extract from uh, public CBCR reportings like that. Um, and th that, that really has an impact on your commercial, uh, commercial uh, 
uh, secrets as well. So, so this this is the sort of I call it the, the back end of the same coin uh, where the front end is called transparency and we're all happy campers, but the the back end might uh, suddenly uh, with this cascading of information and transparency to all stakeholders on a real time basis uh, could start backfiring on on the whole series of. Um, taxpayers' rights you, you're looking at here on, uh, on, on this slide. If we take that one step further on the next slide. Um, this, this is a point of governments are expected to reach a state, certain stage of maturities. Uh, and what I mean with that, and, and Ron step in here, because this is also Asia, if, if you if you share something with Singapore, it's pretty safe. Uh, but if, if you share something with Cambodia, um, maybe a low pay of go government officials and lack of proper controls in place uh, doesn't uh, upfront make you very hunger uh, for, for being fully transparent. Uh, that's an understatement. I, I think the, 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 the statement I want to make is that somewhere hiding in the CBCR reporting is a paper almost no one has read, which is what is the minimum ISO uh, conditions for a government to be a good um, government uh, and uh, of receiving all this tax sensitive data. Um, upon my question to um, the Ministry of Finance in Holland. So if you exchange information from a CBCR, prior to that, do you ever check whether the, the other site, the receiving site has uh, been checked on that ISO certificate the OECD talks about? And they, that, 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 and, and I even advise my clients to have a, a cover letter to the, the, the governments of the, the, the parent country uh, uh, alongside with the CBCR saying, you can only disclose this to governments who have this ISO certification. And, and mm -hmm. the, the answer back from the Ministry of Finance was, what do you mean ISO certificate? You have no clue. We're not checking on that. Is, is that something we should check on? This was the, the, the lead guys at the Ministry of Finance of what until recently I considered a fairly civilized country in terms of education and being up to, to par. So, so this, is, this is sort of the back end. And it, on the previous slide, there was the Bulgarian case where uh, through a hack, 30 million tax sensitive data points were on the street. The only thing the governments did, they postponed their exchange, spontaneous exchange of information for six months with Bulgaria. That was the only ramification uh, coming to that government. So I'm, I'm now touching on the dark side of being fully transparent. Uh, that's another way of saying it. Um, next slide. So, um, this is uh, it, it, it's sort of interesting. I took the uh, the uh, I took the corruption index uh, list uh, for for uh, saying can you be transparent or not? And funny enough, and, and Ron will talk about it in a minute. He took the transparency or non-transparency index list. Uh, that's a slight change of, of thinking, but I think at, at the end of the day, you, you should really combine the two. Um, however, if, if we say, okay, a country like Denmark is not, is, is, uh, is a non, is, is not a, sorry, yeah, a country like Denmark is not known to be a very corrupt country. It's very de decent and, and, and clean. However, if, if I read in the newspaper in Denmark uh, that um, the day before uh, Microsoft bought Navision and uh, is planning to move the IP to Ireland, then I, I'm, I'm suddenly 
concerned about transparency in a Danish setting. So maybe they're very high on the corruption index in, in the sense that there's no corruption, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, I don't get that leakage hitting the, uh, the Danish Financial Times on something which was supposed to be fully undisclosed because Microsoft just acquired Navision and there was already a news flash saying, oh, Microsoft is going to move its Navision IP to Ireland. Well, unbelievable. But yeah, there's different uh, there's differences, I guess, in how you, you look at it. Um, if we take the next point, uh, actually, uh, Michael, is this um, something you recognize that countries are with a certain profile um, do come across as very civilized, but suddenly seem to be different animal when you talk to them? Yeah, that's a very, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I think, yeah, I think that's a fair observation. Um, not always those you may um, anticipate as well would be um, a high level view. I think a lot of this depends on your own relationship with the tax authorities as well. Um, so very often you can you can have a country that you would expect to be right at the top of this uh, the list, giving you sort of a very reasonable um, dialogue or discussion, and then a, a very minor issue could suddenly spark a huge debate on something that you just didn't imagine it could possibly be a, a point of conversation. Fortunately, we don't have many towards the bottom end of this list, so I don't you know, I wouldn't want to go there, but certainly I would agree with what you said. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next, next slide. Um, the the exchange of information. And so the, the 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 question we already alluded on when um, the tax authorities you deal with you trust, uh, but you forget to ask uh, if if they uh, as part of the exchange of information of tax sensitive data. They, they throw things over the fence, like my example with the Dutch. Uh, apparently, there was no checking mechanism at the Ministry of Finance or, or ever, no one at the Ministry of Finance in The Hague actually read that ISO certificate was needed to, uh, to throw a CBCR over the fence. Um, and uh, you can imagine if... if um, say in the old days Unilever was filing a CBCR in, in the Netherlands and suddenly uh, they would throw it over the fence to Cambod Cambodia uh, 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 governments. Um, I think Ron will have an interesting story about that, how that then works in terms of commercial sensitivity you're, you're dealing with. So it's not so much the one you're faced with, but where does that data flow after you handed it over is, is as important almost. Next slide. Um, I, I would like to hand over to Ron to, to also give a, a little bit of an Asian flavor to you know, what, what we're dealing with here. Uh, Ron, do you wanna take it away? Sure. The opening point have um, oftentimes an independent court system. You don't have all the dispute resolution mechanisms that you would have in Europe or North America. So because of that, it, it behooves you to do a bit more planning, due diligence on, on the front end. Um, and that's why later I talk about uh, the importance of, of rulings. Uh, there's a lot more gaps in, in the law. Um, so they, you know, they, they really do uh, serve a purpose to fill those gaps, and just being aware that you know you're you're not going to have as many uh, uh, avenues to pursue this on the flip side. Um, a lot of times, you know, transparency of the authority boils down to documentation. Uh, you may prepare very detailed arguments on technical nuances, and they really don't want to discuss that. They they find a, a way to see if if a certain uh, document is uh, stamped in the right place, if it's not, they don't even consider the document. So it, it becomes a, a real uh, form over a substance approach with some of the authorities. Um, th that said, you know, we have had a, a lot 
of success with both informal and formal rulings. Um, and it really comes down to, uh, of course, trust and just uh, uh, build, building that trust with, with the tax tax authorities that, uh, you know, you, you uh, share uh, best practices with them and, um, you know, are building it over, over the long, the long term. Seemed up going out. Can you still hear me? Uh, we can still hear you. I think the slides are gone missing, but. Uh, yeah, give me, give me one minute. Sorry. Uh, maybe in the, in the meantime, Michael, do you see any, any difference in, in terms of transparency as Ron now indicates uh, being a Myanmar and uh, that, 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 that's a totally different world uh, looking at, at Asia in terms of transparency. Are you um, using different yardsticks for transparency in Asia versus uh, say Europe? Yeah, interesting question. I, I think the short answer is no. Um, but I don't think that's because we are um, necessarily not recognizing the differences. Um, but it's more when we sort of, as, a, as an organization started on our transparency journey, we, we wanted to go with one minimum global standard. So effectively we sort of said, well, okay, well, what is it that we need to deliver in EMEA? Um, look at countries like the UK with their tax strategy and all these kind of things that we need to make sure we have the right level of um, transparency and compliance for, and then applying that globally. So, we've kind of written our policy in that respect, but I completely understand where you're coming from with the Asia perspective, because it has a different, it just has a different take on, on this to the MF position. It, in many ways, it just isn't something that is engaging at the forefront of the mind, as far as I can see, but it, it comes down to a lot more of the, um, it feels a lot more unilateral in the way that things are done in Asia. You know, we, we always block Asia together as one, one thing, but actually it's a whole load of different countries with very different approaches to things. And, you know, and even the question probably is as much what are the differences within Asia as they are between Emir and Asia. Very good. Thank you. Ron? Did we lose Ron? I think we've lost Ron. So shall we go to the next slide? Wait for one minute. Uh, this this was sort of the 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 different table where you you. Uh, I'm not sure, Michael. Would you would you ever take a look at uh, the corruption index table and this transparency table, which apparently are very uh, authoritative tables to look at uh, mm. and, and, and drive your communication and interaction with governments is that ever past your desk or is this a totally different view from the tax arena it's a, it's a very interesting um, angle which I, i'll be completely honest i haven't ever really considered um i guess there was an element of this I, we you kind of consider almost through the back door when you when you talk about cbcr and you mentioned the disclosure and the you know the issue you mentioned with the Netherlands, and I think we we're kind of open and aware of that issue that when CBCR starts getting passed between tax authorities, there's a likelihood that certain tax authorities won't necessarily deal with that data or that information in the with the same integrity that they would do in other jurisdictions, and that's definitely a concern, um, and almost makes you feel like we're kind of entering into public CBCR for those of us not just in banks and extractive industries by the back door. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd ever use corruption indexes as, as a yardstick for what kind of disclosures we'd make. But again, I, I looking your list here is very interesting. Um, we have operations in the top four of those countries. Ordinarily, that goes down to number number eighty. But we don't we don't file anything in any of the others. So maybe it's by default you kind of that answer is already placed for me. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different angle. Uh, Ron, uh, you're back, so good to uh, see you back. Uh, we I asked uh, Michael the question on uh, uh, whether he ever uses the corruption index. Maybe you 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 pick that up or lists like yours. Uh, so I, I give the word back to you. Uh, 
Thanks. I mean, I, I just put this in to, to highlight that when we talk about Asia, uh, most people have uh, experience with, with Singapore, uh, Japan, Korea, the, the, the top ones. Um, and I mean, you know, just going from the news, you, you wouldn't really hold China out so much as an example, exemplar of uh, transparency as maybe you would uh, a Singapore or a Denmark. And yet, you know, China's right in the middle. Uh, you know, get down to, to Thailand, you know, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, where I do a lot of projects, you know, you need to keep it in, in the back of, back of your mind. And I kind of take this also with, um, when I talk a lot about documentation, you do the, um, the ease of doing business rankings. Um, there, it's a similar uh, breakout. And then the um, paying taxes subset. And you can see how many hours are spent on paying taxes in a place like uh, Vietnam, where it's uh, something like, last time I looked at it, it was over 1,200 hours. A lot of that is VAT forms. So how paper-driven, this is several years ago, how paper-driven the tax function is, uh, how non-digital it is. So you, you get, you can glean these insights uh, from these rankings. I mean, I don't want to overstate Okay, shall we move on to the next slide? Sure. Okay, so in here, you know, we, we, we've already addressed it. Uh, will, will corporates be willing to disclose sensitive information? Um, you know, one, you have uh, the risk that the authorities aren't paid that well, that they may not uh, view confidentiality the same way we do. Uh, but there's also a technology aspect of this. When you're dealing in um, lesser developed countries, they don't have the resources to, to have um, you know, protection against cyber, uh, you know, hackers, cybersecurity risks. So you, you sort of have a, a double-edged sword of, of risk there, one uh, at the individual level and one uh, at the technology level. Um, we'll, we're developing... Uh, countries focus on short-term goals. Uh, with this, I was just trying to um, bring out a flavor that what I see in the current environment, um, you know, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia get, get a fair amount of their tax revenue from resources, oil and gas. Of course, uh, you know, oil prices have, have been down for a number of years. Uh, you're entering into all these free trade agreements. Let, let's say that's another quarter of their, their tax base. Um, the other you know, half is made up of you know, indirect tax and uh, uh, by and large, uh, personal income tax generally delivers more uh, uh, to the coffers than, than corporate income tax. So, you know, because of, of resource constraints, uh, I, I think they find transactional taxes, of course, easier to collect and, and that may be the, the initial focus um, from there. I think that they'll still have shortfalls and then they'll, they'll move on towards uh, really focusing on, on corporate tax. Um, let's see, so I also then wanna talk about the, a little bit of the unreasonable tax positions um, or the typo my stuff made on Achilles heel, apologize for that. I didn't catch that earlier. Um, what are the authorities view on the following? Uh, net operating losses shouldn't be a, a controversial topic. And yet, uh, you know, you have losses over a longer period of time and the tax authorities think that you're doing something nefarious. And uh, you get into long discussions on you know, why would you come to this country if, if you've been making losses for more than three years um, and being, uh, you know, uh, somewhat disbelieving of, of something that is, is very well, well established. And um, uh, we've had other instances where the tax authorities have tried to disallow NOLs simply on a formality that um, there was a missing uh, initial on one of the uh, uh, audit reports that you know, they, there was a, a form problem. So they wanted to throw out all the NOLs. 
So rather interesting view on, on something that's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, management service fees. Um, again, brought out in, in the BEPS report as a, a typical area of, of approach as parties is it says management service fees, that will be disallowed. But if it says administrative service fees, that's okay. So, uh, you know, it really goes to some sometimes very, very basic uh, uh, arguments. Um, the, the confidentiality, um, this came out um, after the, the Starbucks uh, ethical uh, view of taxation and, and paying the right amount of tax. Um, I think the challenge is in a, um, in a market where you know you're you're in a democracy, you, you have a um, two party system. The the media is independent. Uh, 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 that's a certain set of of rules. The government owns all the uh, media outlets and the newspapers. Um, you know this can be used to sort of uh, bully taxpayers. Um, transfer pricing was previously used as sort of a, a code word for um, committing tax evasion uh, by certain authors in, in, in Vietnam. Now, I, I've seen some recent news articles, and they, they call it transfer pricing fraud, where earlier they just left off the word fraud and said, this company so it's a misunderstanding of, of the concepts, but it does color the public's opinion, and then it becomes a, a public relations uh, issue and an issue for uh, for your brand. Um, another uh, example of uh, just unusual, uh, unexpected things where advertising expenses were, were disallowed, just as a, a broad stroke um, about 10 years ago. And the, the thinking here was that if we allow advertising expenses, these multinationals have much greater budgets than our local companies, and they will, um, you know, put our local companies out of business. So a bit of uh, protectionism sort of baked into the, the tax code. Now that's now been uh, uh, reversed. Uh, um, On your uh, breaking, you're breaking up a little bit. So. Oh, okay. I think we're back. Yeah, go ahead. That's okay. I was at the end of the slide. And next yeah, slide. On, the, on the balancing act, uh, the balancing act may be a question to Michael. Uh, what, what's your biggest challenge on, on that balancing act, uh, Michael? Uh, is there I, I any the geography or any particular technical topic or, or features in dealing with tax authorities where you feel that balance is always very delicate and hard to manage? Yeah, um, look, I, the honest answer is I don't think so at the moment. I don't, I don't see an area where, um, I mean, if, if I think about areas where we sort of have the, the greatest uh, requirement to disclose and to make sure that we've got all the information aside. It's in some of the more developed countries like Australia, the UK, but then equally their compliance is moving in a different way to, to a lot of the countries we've spoken about before where, you know, they're obviously moving to this kind of front loaded compliance view, um, whether that's the justified trust in, in Australia where you have that slightly front loaded way or, or the business risk review in the UK. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think so at the moment, I, I guess what, what particularly struck out, struck me on this conversation and the piece that Ron just talked through was, you know, to what impact that, that COVID piece is going to have on this. Um, and I think the second question, you know, will developing countries seek the short term goals? You could almost widen that to, to all countries, couldn't you? Because we, we know we're going to be facing this massive deficit yep. crisis. Um, I think, you know, we, we also can see here in, in the West that this is fueled some form of inequality so governments are going to be looking to do something politically to, 
to sort of try and even up the agenda a little bit as well. So, you know, they can't be raising tax rates on a personal level. We've got to be filling the, de the de deficit somehow. So I, I would very much expect to see some pretty heavy handed measures coming in, both in developing and developed economies. Uh, and then going into some of these specific points, you know, you've, we've seen such a trend in terms of nulls um, and denials or partial denials of carry forward tax losses, et cetera, being enshrined in legislation anyway in UK, US, et cetera. I, I can't see anywhere this is going to go other than to keep deepening that trend. You know, if we, you know, so many countries are going to come out with massive losses coming out of this period of the last 12 months. But there's no way that governments can afford to give full credit for tax losses and fill their deficit ad infinitum. It's just something that's going to come together. And, uh, and that's when we are, I think we're going to have that real challenge on this balancing act as to yeah. you know, trying to make sure we are fully compliant with that. Yeah, especially the NOLs, if they're so fast that uh, the next 10 years you're not paying tax, they can't afford that uh, trade-off uh, from their side, uh, definitely. Shall we move on or on to the next slide? Sure. Okay, uh, with this slide, I, I just try to, to step back uh, a little bit. Um, when, when I get to, to history uh, with, with Vietnam, uh, a lot of the documentation, Union, uh, other Eastern European countries, so, so that flavor has kind of still remained. Um, uh, Cambodia, you have different uh, environment. Um, Myanmar, um, some of the laws in the books go back to the, the British colonial era. Um, so, you know, knowing that that history uh, uh, it is a very good starting point. I mean, it's a very good starting point for some of these smaller uh, jurisdictions. Um, uh, political situation um, in Vietnam, there, there were a number of uh, laws that, that were passed, uh, you know, for uh, you know, they, they had one that, that we funded in, in Eurocham. It, it was taxation of um, beverages with carbonation, not sugared beverages, but they wanted to put a tax on beverages with carbonation. We, we affectionately called it the bubble tax. And we, we couldn't find any medical reports that, uh, you know, wanted to, you know, that showed that bubbles in, in soft drinks caused any medical problems. We found a lot of reports that said sugar uh, caused problems. Uh, so some things that uh, you, you can't forget the political aspect um, and how that one party system can impact uh, the rule of law. Um, in certain countries, you don't need legal training to be a judge, but you do need to be a member of a certain political party. Um, you all, which you know, was very surprising to me when I, I researched attorney-client privilege. It actually was the reverse: that by law you have an obligation to report to the government if, if something may go against them. So. Um, sometimes it really challenges uh, your assumptions. Uh, regional versus um, central control uh, really focused on tax incentives. Do the people that are offering you these, uh, the sweetheart deal of tax incentives really have the authority to grant them? Uh, in Vietnam, sorry, sorry to drop off. The, the Wi-Fi is going in and out for some reason tonight. Yeah, um, we, we, have, just to, uh, um, we have about five minutes left, so we need to cut cut short uh, to make sure we... Sure. Yeah, go ahead. It, it just very quickly, um, uh, you know, there, there have been, um, in many jurisdictions, no APAs, no mutual agreement procedures. Uh, I checked with a, a friend at uh, a big four, and still to, to date, um, you know, no successful tax cases in Vietnam. Um, but things are changing quickly. Myanmar is bringing in a tax tribunal, tax administration law. Um, I talked to a number of Korean uh, law firms that believe uh, 
uh, this year that they're going to bring um, tax cases to Vietnam. Um, a lot of it uh, relates to fairly straightforward things uh, like taxation of uh, internal reorganizations. Uh, but they, they think the time is, is right that they can win, win these cases. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, nothing really earth shattering here. Uh, just, uh, this was sort of my, uh, uh, calling card for use of tax rulings uh, widely, uh, what it can help you with. Um, again, a, a lot of things, uh, turn on, on proper documentation. Uh, for example, they, they had a, uh, e-filing, but then when you went to the tax authorities, of course, the practice always lags and they demanded to have all the files in, in hard copy. Um, so, you know, you, you have to kind of read the fine print. Uh, you, you have this tension where they're trying to move digital, but uh, the practice and, and some of the regulations don't, don't get it updated. Um, the, the media issues we talked about uh, covered. And uh, I, again, uh, in some of these jurisdictions, it's it just best to uh, think about what your risk is and try to get a, a ruling to get uh, some certainty and fill, fill the gaps. Um, cognizant of time. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we have one minute left, so. Okay. Um, just, just, Please. Uh, the interestingly, the the gold mine case, uh, we were able to explain it, and they we had two licenses, and because it wasn't cross border, uh, they didn't think of it as a transfer pricing situation because in their their mind, transfer pricing had to be cross border. It was it was two mining licenses with with different tax incentives. Um, and just highlight some of the unexpected things. Stamp duty in, in Myanmar had a 10 times penalty, 1,000%. Uh, it's now changed, but that was the highest I think I've, I've ever come. Please, next slide. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take over here, uh, Ron. Your, your connection is sort of breaking up. Um, well, a, a high degree of reporting drives a higher transparency. That sort of seems to be a logical statement. But then if we uh, see the transparency in financial institution and the extractive industries uh, being linked to license to operate. Uh, do we expect um, uh, governments to apply the same transparency levels and, and also lock it into uh, license to operate? That's the big question. Uh, if, you, if you see the digital interaction with taxpayers, which uh, uh, Michael, you refer to, um, in the UK, for example, uh, or if you take um, a, a data set, which is a, an e-invoice um, you, you want to share with your customer in Italy, you need to file that package of data uh, with a, uh, a, a desk of the Italian tax authority who checks the compliant nature uh, of, of that data set. Um, and that's called a pre-clearance before you can send your invoice to your customer. Well, that kind of, um, I call it micro steps in, li in a, a license to operate is coming uh, to the surface more and more often. So the digital checks governments put on a part of your uh, data sets uh, are going to be the game changers in terms of uh, a license to operate. For example, if you can't send your invoice to customers because the Italian FISC has not given you a digital watermark so you can actually invoice your customer, then obviously your cash flow is drying up. 
well, that's a very hard message to the boardroom. Uh, your cash is drying up in Italy because we didn't get that watermark in place. Well, other places uh, like like Brazil and, and, and also Russia are picking up on that. So I wouldn't call uh, it that all governments move to, uh, if you're not tax compliance, you lose your license to operate. But I would say, and that's sort of a little bit what Ron said in, uh, in, in earlier conversations, uh, we, we, we saw that as well. If you, um, if you see the magnitude of forms being filed, uh, there's a tipping point now where the, 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 the data packages become digital and digital gives tax authorities an easier way to disrupt your business operations uh, why, by withholding you this digital watermark to a VAT uh, um, uh, compliant invoice in, in places like Italy. So it doesn't become uh, a, a full license to operate, but it does disrupt your supply chain in such a way that really someone in the boardroom is, uh, is going to knock on, on, on things. Michael, any, any final thoughts on this and Ron? No, I'm not. I think I think you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head here. I think it's this ongoing digitalization that's going to be the piece that gives us the biggest challenge in terms of transparency. Is these are uh, all become weapons in the tax authorities' uh, armory, effectively? Almost yes, almost like an unlimited armor of weapons uh, yeah. of of mass destruction. Almost uh, yes. I, I, unfortunately, I tend to agree with that, uh, and it's being used already. Ron, any final remarks? I, I think you, you tied it up well. And on the earlier slide, I, I said, you know, the the links, not so much the obvious of ending your business license, but that when they, they coordinate and a tax audit becomes a labor and immigration audit, they effectively uh, can shut you shut you down. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it spills over. Good. 